Put your camera over here, will you? You don't want to look through it, do you? No. I'll put a two-inch lens on here. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> will you take this bench away and move your light closer? Now, now tip it down. Tip it down until I tell you to hold, hold it, little up, up, little, hold it. A small studio in West London on a cold day in November 1966. A man demonstrates the art of lighting and photography to a band of enthusiasts. He is on a visit to London for the publication of his memoirs, intriguingly titled Fun in a Chinese Laundry. In this programme, filmmaker and writer Kevin Brownlow asks him about his life and work, for he is one of the giants of cinema history. His name, Joseph von Sternberg. Sternberg is the embodiment of the great maestro director, in total command and supremely conscious of his originality. I don't admire anyone. Uh, most of my work was done in, in uh, opposition of the work that was done by other people. And uh, of course, I have no uh, traceable influence to uh, to motion pictures, but my uh, influences, if there are any, are from literature and painting and other arts, which uh, I then incorporate into the film. I'm afraid in most cases, I uh, not only supervise, but I actually do it, and I do the decoration and the costumes and the write the story and control the actors and make the props and cut the picture. I do the, the, the entire thing. It takes me quite some time to do it. This absolute control produced a visual style which was unique and utterly personal. Take this off. No, you can't do that. Take, an hour. Take, take that off, will you? Just this one. Throw that down on... Perhaps no other director has ever quite matched the complexity and subtlety of pictorial effect which Sternberg achieved in his best work. His admirers asked him during his visit to London to show them just how he went about the setting up and lighting of a shot. You are the only director that Hollywood cameramen admit photographed his own films. Well, I don't know what Hollywood cameramen admit. I, I do photograph all my films. And you control the lighting? Yes, lighting is part of the photography. It's, it's very important to control the lighting. When um, an extract from one of your films appears on television or in a compilation film, it is instantly recognizable by its texture, a texture which no one else ever achieves. Um, how did you begin to be aware of lighting? Well, uh, I've had a, a, a vast history in, in, in films as... as uh, if, if from every viewpoint to uh, before I became a director, and I think it's quite essential that uh, that uh, directors should have that uh, that uh, that experience. Sternberg began as a repairer of damaged films before the First World War, later graduating to props man, assistant director, and finally director. He was born in a poor quarter of Vienna, and his first experience of the United States was the harsh existence of an immigrant. Low Life America makes its appearance in his early films. His first picture, The Salvation Hunters, made at a cost of just over a thousand pounds, brought him to the notice of Douglas Fairbanks and Chaplin. He was, to quote the papers, the young Austrian with a streak of genius. The success of his first film, was followed by a period of disputes with his studios. But in 1927, he
he made the first real gangster picture, Underworld. And the next year, another success, The Docks of New York. On the set, Sternberg quickly acquired the reputation of a martinet. You want to know what I want it for? So, yeah, which lamp on it? Huh? Which lamp? Which size lamp? Well, get a gauze down here. You don't want to know what I want it for. <laughs> I'm difficult, if that phrase is correct, in uh, demanding an, an absolute silence while I work. And this is not strange, because if you write or if you paint or if you sculpt, you, you have a closed door, you have some place where someone may knock to ask permission to enter. But in the case of a director who has a much more difficult job to do, he, he's got a thousand people around him who always come in and out and make nuisance of themselves. And uh, he has a thousand problems to take care of and must work, work, work from early in the morning to late at night, day after day, to provide an hour and a half of entertainment. And of course, knowing that, I insist on this uh, thing, and uh, I'm very humorous about it. This is not taken seriously, but because I tell people in back of me to take their wristwatches off, lest, lest I hear them. I mean, it's, it's, uh, I just establish a certain atmosphere. Handy. They should be here so we can use them. We had a very funny incident with old Joker. He has a sense of humor, you know, somewhere if you can dig it out and you'll be a natural human being. He was on a big rostrum, a very high rostrum, I think 15, 16 feet high, and a ladder down, you see. We're coming to the end of the day, and Joe walks the edge of the rostrum, tops on, uh, steps on the top step, and slides right down onto his bottom, you see. And uh, just sat there and said, 9 o'clock tomorrow morning, and walked off the set. <laughs> that was the actor Clive Brook, who worked on several films with a director whose view of actors has always been an extremely rigorous one. Actors... Uh... They are actually very desirable for a director, though uh, you select an actor for his particular appearance, and uh, he then comes on the stage, and he, he usually wishes to have the director instruct him completely. The more, the better. And uh, it is only that... Uh, they're used, of course, like, as marionettes are used. They're used as bits of color in the canvas, and uh, very many of them uh, appreciate that, and very many of them uh, feel that their ego has been tampered with, and they uh, somehow, much later, after they are successful, manage to, uh, to uh, let it be known that they were completely uh, manhandled and, and uh, abused. An actor is nothing unless he has something to play. When you look at an actor, he must correspond to a vision that you have of the sort of man or the sort of woman that you want in your film. And you uh, proceed to do something with that object. You have to arrange his hair, you have to design the costume, you have to provide a background for him, you have to make him do something which is to your liking, and uh, you have to eliminate things that are bad in the actor. You have to bring out things that are good. It's a complete uh, process of always uh, being in charge of the human being and never allowing that human being to be himself. Sternberg has written graphically of his struggles with the German actor Emil Jannings during the making of The Blue Angel. The film was finally a huge success. The partnership of Sternberg and Dietrich was continued through another six films. A new kind of erotic symbol was produced. Cool, mocking, assured, and yet vulnerable too. This persona was created with infinite labor and precision. We practiced the first shot in uh, Shanghai Express. The dialogue read, how long is it since I've seen you, Doc? Now, she took that in 60 times, and it went on and on and on. I think he took the second take in, in the end. I don't say there's separate takes, but they went on with one camera going on and repeating uh, this line again, and yes, my lady, go on again, and that again, this, that, uh, chin up a little bit, eyes down a little bit, you forgot to blink or something, you know, that sort of thing. He did really uh, treat Marlena as a marionette, but, I mean, he did really direct her in great detail. She's an extraordinary woman and uh, she was a great beauty and uh, 
and it was uh, she was a fine assistant and uh, very easy to uh, respond. She responded beautifully in the, and uh, gave me an, an image very often, uh, which was not only exactly as I wanted, but very often better than I wanted. And uh, she was she was quite a gal.